Well, it's a crazy honor to be with you guys today. I was, um, I moved to Portland in 1997. And when I got to Portland, Oregon, I was 19. I had my little brother, he was 16, just about to turn 17 in tow. And uh, when we got here, I love the waterfront because I used to live there and we, the waterfront downtown, the second bench from the middles where I spent my first night here in uh, Portland, Oregon. And it would be through a journey of time that God would be doing a work in my life and my brother's life and he would bless us. We'd find ourselves being able to come to uh, Portland Bible College and we would start a journey of God transforming our life. And we'd start a journey of God taking a broken little white Mexican, for those of you that don't know, I'm Hispanic. Any Hispanics? Hey! I keep seeing faces and then I get all excited because there are people that were in our youth ministry back in the day. Actually, their older siblings were in our youth ministry. Y'all are getting so young. And um, when I got to, to Portland, I'd been on quite a journey. Uh, everyone in this room has a story, a story of some level of brokenness and, and God is drawn to brokenness. God is drawn to, to people that have broken dreams because God has the ability to take brokenness and mold and shape it into something beautiful beyond recognition. And when I got here, God was doing a work in my life. I, I tell you a little bit of my backstory just so that when you look up here, I hope there's some of my brokenness that you can identify with in my journey. And I hope that it inspires you to see a God that can do the impossible. And when I was about four years old, I lived in uh, Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah, and my father uh, made a decision to take his life and uh, couldn't handle the stress of life and things going on and put my family on a unique journey. It'd be a few years later, my mom would get married and in that process at a little Baptist church, come on, we love the Baptist, right? And uh, we, we love the Baptist, right? Come on, we're not Baptist, but we love them. Come on, somebody. And uh, my parents would come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior through some premarital counseling. And through that, I would come to know that I was gonna burn in hell if I didn't call out to Jesus, because I had a lot of sin. My mom said, I know you have a lot of sin. You better repent. So I did it, right? And uh, but shortly after that, my parents found themselves in a place of some church hurt and found themselves uh, distancing themselves from the church. And I would start going to a little charismatic church uh, on my own with my younger brother. My older brother and sister were involved in just some pretty wild living. And I was at, at church just seeking God and the Holy Spirit would do a work in my life. When I was 18 years old, I felt the need to just get out because of all the brokenness in my family. And uh, right when I was 18, I moved out and moved far away from home and found myself uh, getting away from the church and getting away from community and getting away from voices that would affirm that there was a plan and purpose for my life. And in that journey, I found myself uh, beginning to step into a world of, of drugs and alcohol and some stuff that wasn't healthy. And uh, it was through a moment of just a total God encounter that God spared my life from some craziness. And that's when me and my brother decided to, to move here to uh, Portland, Oregon. And we showed up uh, there was no status in my life. I was from a broken family, a poor family. Uh, I was a high school dropout. You know, my wife, my wife's super smart. She, uh, she did her high school in three years. And I remind her that I did my high school in three years also. Uh, she just got a degree for it, <laughs> right? And I got to Bible college. My wife is super smart. She's not here today, but I wanna honor her. She did her four-year degree in four years. I did my four-year degree in five years, and I was still pretty happy with that. <laughs> But um, what happened is I, I started this journey here at PBC, and I wanna talk about uh, status a little bit with y'all today, because I, I believe that God has me here to preach something, to teach something, and then reach in and pull something out of you today. And so I want you to go on a journey with me, and that journey should really start with the Word of God. So can we stand to our feet? This is what we do in Dreamers Church. We grab our Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, can I just tell you, I like big Bibles. And if you got one of those phones, you look so cute, but you know what? Throw it on the ground, stomp on it a little bit, and, and go get yourself a real book with a real pen, start underlining some stuff, start circling some stuff, start highlighting some stuff, start going back to some stuff, start memorizing some stuff. Come on, somebody, and let this stuff get inside of here. But I encourage our church, 
Now, I owned a mobile app company. I might tell that story at some point. And, and so I'm all about mobile apps. But can I tell you, there's something about having the written word and open up your Bible. There's notes in my Bible from when Ken was teaching 25 years ago. And I had a moment with God. And guess what? They're not in my phone. They're in my Bible. And when I look at that, I have that moment of God do it again. I have these moments where God does it. So I love the Bible. I love to hold it up. And can you just pray this prayer with me? Say, Father, thank you for my Bible. I believe what it says. I can do what it says I can do. I can be who it says I can be. Holy Spirit, speak to me today. And speak to the one on my right and left. Father, I give you thanks for what you're going to do in advance, Lord. You're going to touch lives. You're going to release freedom, Lord, and it's going to be beautiful. In Jesus' name. Give someone a Bible five, and you can be seated. You know, uh, standing up here is just so fun because I look around, and the faculty here, I want to just for a moment, just honor one or two people just real quick, and then I'm going to preach. But uh, Lanny Hubbard's in the room, and, and Lanny's someone who... When I came through, I, I took Old Testament survey, New Testament survey like y'all did, and then I, I realized there was more to it, so I went and sat in his class again the following year. You know, those, those dead spaces in your schedule. I actually just went and retook classes. Because of being a high school dropout, I struggled uh, with my learning and had some learning disabilities and couldn't keep up with writing and couldn't, my spelling grammar was a little bit uh, horrid. and. Um, as sitting in Lanny's classes, just, uh, Lanny, I don't know where you're at, but you've given me such a, a passion uh, for the Word of God and a passion for study. Lanny's just such a student, and so I just want to honor him. And, you know, also, uh, Ken's in the room, and I'm going to talk about him later on, but Glenda's not here. She's out of town, but Glenda, in a season of me just going through some crazy stuff and brokenness and things in my family, stepped into my world and she, she pastored me, and she spoke into my life, and she counseled me, and she helped me get through some stuff. And the faculty and the team here have done so much. Travis, Travis was one of my students, believe it or not. Uh, Ken had me teach prison epistles, and I'm like, oh, shoot, what are the prison epistles, you know? And I had to go back and start studying. I was youth pastoring. I was five years out of college. And so I, I start teaching the prison epistles, and I've got Travis Arnold in my freaking class the first year. And the dude's a genius. So he would teach. I would teach on something, then he would turn in a paper that, like, had way more notes than I had taught on. And I'm like, what is going on here? And so the next year I taught, I taught it for two years. I actually taught off of his notes that he turned in. <laughs> and uh, Travis, you are the bomb.com. And, and I thank you. Um, you know, we have an internship down in Austin, Texas. And we've got um, a group of uh, five students there that are taking PBC classes as an affiliate. And so many of your teachers are teaching us. And it's a huge blessing. And Today, I feel like my assignment is to uh, talk to you about this topic of status. And I want to, um, I'm studying right now, working on my master's degree and studying the Greco-Roman culture and New Testament studies. And in there, we, we talk a lot about status in the early church. And in society, we have, a, we have a status problem. Everyone wants status, right? You guys are very aware of this. It doesn't matter what you're doing. And when, when I, back in the day when I was young, come on, it's so weird to say that, but y'all are so young that it really was back in the day for me. And uh, when, when I was younger, like, like my, my dad was teaching me saying, hey, when you get older, you're going to work somewhere and you're going to, you're going to, it's going to take you 20 years to get to a place of leadership and do something. And, and the vision was this long term. And then when I got to Bible college there, I, the, the World Wide Web was exploding in the late 90s. When I was in Bible college for freshman year and also Pastor Calvin Sanders is here. We graduated together. Can you tell Pastor Calvin we love him? Calvin, can you stand and wave to these people? This is how beautiful you could look in ministry. <laughs> His niece is here today, uh, one of my good friends. Um, but uh, what... Um, I totally just spaced where I was going with that. It, it, was, it was so good, though, trust me. And when, when we talk about, 
<laughs> you, you sidetracked me, Calvin. Uh, when, when we talk about status and we talk about uh, what's going on, the, the internet comes out and all of a sudden we have social media and social media things are taking place and everyone begins to have status at a very young age. And all of a sudden, young people are building technology that's changing the world. And things change, and some of it for the good, that people don't feel like I have to wait till forever. But people also began to feel a weight that I have to have status now that was maybe meant for another season or another place. And then some people felt, began to feel like I'll never have status. And as we look at the early church, what we have is Paul is actually, and so was Jesus, he's actually talking a lot about status and status in the church and how status impacts things. And I want you to uh, open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 2. And I want to take a look at a little story that's there. And it's a story of Elisha and Elijah. And Elijah is this awesome prophet. He's, he's done all these miracles. He shows up on the scene, and you guys would know these stories. And, and he prays that there be no rain, and rain stops, right? That'd be pretty cool. I tried that for 18 years and then just finally left Portland. <laughs> I, I did it once in Austin, and it works great. Uh, it just doesn't rain there. I'm powerful down in Austin. Uh, it didn't work here in Portland. And, and he, he prays for this woman, for her son. The son's healed. He prays for oil, and oil keeps coming in the jar. He does all these things with just 450 prophets of Baal come, and, and fire comes to his altar. They're swallowed up, right? Elijah is one bad dude. He's very much like, like your, your, your Ken, your, your, your Lanny, your Travis, your Glenda, right? Your, your Sarahs, these, these people that are just awesome leaders here. And Elijah has established himself, and on comes the scene is Elijah, the, uh, Elisha, the younger. And Elisha comes on, and they have this moment of transition and in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9, it says, Then they crossed over. Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken from you. So Elisha answered, Please let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Turn to your neighbor and say, I want a double portion. Elijah said, You've asked something pretty difficult. Turn to your neighbor and say, That's going to be difficult. Turn to your other neighbor and say, I'm really the bomb.com. It's going to be very, very difficult. And he said, but if you see me when I'm taken from you, you'll have it. If not, you won't. And they continued walking and talking, and a chariot of fire shows up to pick up Elijah. That's just so cool, right? Chariot of fire shows up, takes him. They, they, they're off and gone. And um, it says that uh, Elisha went up to heaven in a whirlwind. And we look at this passage and we see, I think we see a picture of culture today. I see a culture of there are people that have gone before us that are giants of the faith. And they've done some really cool things. And something inside of us as young people, I'm 45, so I'm right in the mix. I can still call myself young to some, but I'm old to many. And we can find ourselves in this mix beginning to go, you know what I want? I, I want to do double. Uh, God, I want to do something bigger. I want to do something greater. Does anyone want to do something greater? Come on, you just feel like in your heart, God, I want to do something that's significant. It might be in politics. It might be in business. It might be in ministry. It might be in missions, but there's a hunger inside of you. you say, God, I want to, I want my life to have significance. I think there was something like this in Elisha. And he said, I wanted something, but there's a challenge to Elisha's life. When we study out the New Testament, anyone love the New Testament? Come on, we, go, we, we, we see some, some things in the Old Testament that really get revealed in the New Testament. And if we go study the name Elisha, the mentoree, and we see what his life did, he's mentioned one time in the New Testament. And here's what's interesting. His prayer was answered. He did twice as much as his mentor. Everything that Elisha did when you do the study, he did twice as much. And we walk around, we say, I want to be like that. I want a double portion of my mentor's anointing. But when we go to the New Testament, you go, wait a second, Elisha's mentioned once and it's in a negative context. Well, maybe it's just because the New Testament didn't write about the two of them. So then you go, hey, let's do a word search. 
on Elisha. And does his name come up? It actually comes up 29 times. And every time that it comes up, it's a beautiful declaration of a man that pursued all that God had on his life. When Jesus comes, think about this. Hey, your dad and I went to school together. And uh, when you look at the Mount of Transfiguration, guess who shows up? You got Moses representing the law to come hang out with Jesus. And you got Elijah representing the prophets to come be with Jesus. How come it wasn't Elisha? He did twice as much. How come the New Testament doesn't brag on Elisha? Twice as much Elisha, double portion, yeah! How come Paul wasn't writing? Give me the double portion! I wanna tell you because you're not called to live out a double portion of anyone. You're called to live out your portion. And when you live out your portion and you be who God's called you to be, what happens is you begin to transform societies. You begin to have an impact on those around you. And I feel like today, you should turn to your neighbor and say, I don't want the double portion. Turn to your other neighbor and say, other neighbor, I was just joking. I want my portion. I feel like God has me here today to just bring out a little thought in your world. And that, that is that God's fearfully and wonderfully made you. The biggest attack on your generation right now is people questioning the Imago Dei inside of you, the image of God. Genesis 1, verse 26, 27, 28, the fourfold purpose of man is in there. But verse 26, it, it talks about this idea that you and I, we are created in the very image of God. And that image is what marks us. It's what shapes us. And it says, God said, let us make mankind, man and woman. Someone say man and woman. In our image, in our likeness, so that they, someone say man or woman, may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures moving along the ground. You and I were created in the image of God. It's what separates us from all of creation. And what the enemy would love to come and say to you is that you were not created in the image of God. You were created in the image of feelings. And however you feel, that is what you are, and you need to come into agreement with your feelings. All the world right now around you in the public sector is dealing with this issue, what do I do with feelings? Can I tell you something? I wanna kick the devil in the teeth today because my beautiful little daughter's over here, she's a sophomore in high school, and if she came to me and said, Dad, I feel ugly. I wouldn't go, well, baby, it's because you must be ugly then. And let's come into agreement with ugliness. And how can, we, how can we make this ugliness just fully ugly? I'd say, no, to the hell with that, baby girl. Let me tell you, you were created in the image of God. And my Bible says you're fearfully, wonderfully made. My Bible says that you were molded and shaped by the very hands of God. In your mother's womb, you were shaped. There is a destiny. There is a purpose. There is a hope. You might feel ugly, but that's a feeling who you are. You are a princess. You are a queen. You are called and destined. This world needs you. If we don't have Haley, we are messed up and the devil comes and says no no you feel ugly and we as a world you take the issue and I hope I'm offending some spirits right now that aren't aligning with the kingdom of God you take any issue and you try to tell me that I need to align with the issue and not the word of God and I tell you that is wrong. It's demonic. We need to align with the word of God. God made me who I am. He made me male. He made me female, whatever you are. He made me a child of the king. And we've got to get this into our heart because there is a generation that's losing a fight. And they're, they're saying, I want to do twice as much because of, I want this status rather than saying, God, who did you make me to be? God, how did you create Poncho? My brokenness is something that when it gets in the hands of God becomes beautiful. He begins to mold and shape it. 
But the enemy wants to take your brokenness and say, no, that's who you are. That's who you are. I want to define you that way. And I don't want to be a generation of Elishas that are seeking a double portion. I want to be a, a prophet like Elijah, because Elijah, it said, was a man of faith, just like you and I. Actually, it says a person of faith, like you and I. And it says that he prayed earnestly, and it shifted the natural. I want to be that kind of a person. I don't want to be a person that walks around saying, man, I've taught twice as many lessons as Ken. I've gone to twice as many nations as Ken. I want to be someone that says the same spirit that's anointed Ken for the last several decades to teach and raise up and release people. I want that same spirit of God inside of me to fulfill the mission he's called me to fulfill. And it's a perspective. Ephesians 2.10 says this, you and I were God's workmanship. And that God has created in Christ Jesus, he's created these good works. Turn to someone and say, you were created for good works. He's created good works for you in Christ Jesus that he prepared in advance for you to do. Do you realize today there's actually some good works that God has designed for you? That he created at the foundations of the earth before time. He thought this through and he said, man, if I'm going to make Emma, I, I better prepare in advance because she's such an amazing woman of God with such a crazy huge calling on her life. I better, I better prepare in advance things for her to do. And each one of you, every day God has things, but how many things are we not doing because we're not seeing ourselves as created in the image of God, created with purpose. Instead, we're looking to someone else going, if I could become like them, then I could do what they're doing. You know, the greatest thing that scares me in life is that I would get to the end of my life and look and go, man, I hit the target that I was aiming for, only to find out I was aiming at the wrong target. I want to be somebody that goes after it. I want, to, I want to inspire generations to go after everything that they have, that God's called them to be, that God's called them to do. So I, I, I felt like my assignment today was two-part. I, I want to take a moment. Can I teach you just for five minutes? You guys okay with that? Be all right if I just do a little teaching. And um, the, the, the title I started uh, on the screen was the Imago Day of God and talking about that. But the full title of my message is the Imago Day and the need for modern head coverings within the community of Jesus followers. And I want to talk about this for a moment. Now you need to know I love stirring up controversy. You know how you want to know how I got to know Ken? My freshman year, I wanted to be a musician and uh, but I wasn't good enough to be in the, the PBC band. So we just started our own band called the Homeschool Heroes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The homeschool heroes, and you know what the homeschool hero was? was? The bunch of people with messed up mindsets and bad attitudes rebelling against God with their instruments. And so we wrote a song called Chop It Off. Now when you do a song like Chop It Off on Friday Chapel and open it up with that, you get invited to Ken's office. So Ken and I became good friends and uh, he began to mentor and disciple me as a little misfit. And for some reason, the, the, the time that student body presidents, he, he asked us to do another song to redeem ourselves. At the time you had to wear slacks and a shirt with a collar on it. And so we wrote a song called Blue Jeans. And the song kind of talked about a PBC student that was a rebel and uh, was, was messing around and got in a car wreck and he died and went to hell. And guess what Satan had? And we started singing blue jeans, blue jeans. And we are singing a song about how Satan wears blue jeans. And then we'd go mosh and we'd start just going screamo and crazy. And Calvin would start crowd surfing. I think Jason might have crowd surfed there. Angie didn't. She was holy. She's like my wife. She's a just anointed holy woman of God. And uh, But so um, I got to know Ken in, in this process of, uh, of maybe not doing the right things and what happened is uh, I learned how to redirect 
learn to redirect my energy towards God and my rebellion. Now I like to rebel against the devil, but every once in a while I like to stir it up just theologically and ask some really good questions. And so I'm spending my time studying uh, the New Testament Greco-Roman culture. And what's interesting is the, the whole Bible is this covenantal story that we walk through and that God, uh, you know, continues to speak to his people through the covenant. We see that through the whole Bible. And there's this point in the, in the new covenant where Paul begins to talk and, and he makes these really strong statements in Galatians 3, 26 through 29. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God uh, through faith. And all of you uh, who were water baptized into Christ have been clothed, you've clothed yourself with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. All of you are one in Christ. Jesus, if you belong to Christ and you are Abraham's seed. What's interesting is this same Paul that says there's no male nor female, he writes a passage that I, I wrestled with, you know, when I was uh, in Bible college here and going on a journey when he writes in 1 Corinthians, Paul's writing, and he says this, he says, follow my example as I follow uh, the example of Christ. This is 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. He said, I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman, or the head of every woman is man and the head of Christ is God. And every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut. Uh, but it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut or her, her, her head shaved, then she should just cover her head, he says. Now, this is some pretty intense things Paul's talking about here. He says, the man not ought to cover, cover his head for since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. And man did not come from woman, but woman from man. And neither was man created for woman, but woman created for man. It was for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head, because of the angels, nevertheless, is a woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman, but uh, woman came from man, so man also came from woman, but everything is from God. And then Paul goes on to say, so judge for yourself. And you're like, Paul, what are you writing here? Chapter seven, he told us to, uh, to engage in mutual submission. Men submit to women, women submit to to men there should be mutual submission he goes on and now he's talking about this whole idea of women should be wearing head coverings and then he says ah but don't forget women come from uh, men but men come from women and you're going Paul what are you trying to say here and what's very interesting about this passage is it's also intertwined right in chapter 11 he's talking about the communion table and Paul's saying uh, to the people. He says, hey, when you guys go to have communion, some of you are just getting wasted, drunk, eating all the food while other people don't eat. I had to take some time to go study this out to go, why would people be getting drunk? Is it because they were showing up early and sneaking in some early drinks? Or, or is there something about the society that was there? And in the Greco-Roman culture, it was a patron society, which meant when people would get together, about 83% of the, the people in that culture actually lived uh, at or below the sustenance line for their daily needs, which means each day they were, they were doing what they needed to do just to get food for that day. And in the culture, 1% would be these elite, crazy wealthy, and about 16% of them would be wealthy, and they'd be very, very wealthy, and there's a huge gap between the two. And so what they would do is people would follow them around to parties, and you would be part of a, a cluster of people, of someone that had status. And someone that had status, which means they had wealth and they had power, they'd have an entourage of, uh, entourage of people that didn't have status that would follow them around and make them feel really good. They'd laugh at all their jokes. How many of you like it when there's someone around you and just like, no matter what you say, they're like, ha, 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 so good. I love it. Like we all love that person, right? So they would just get tons of those people that would follow them around and they would, they would laugh at their jokes. They would celebrate them and they felt really special. And at a party, they would be eating and getting drunk, but anyone that was a patron to them that was following them around was not allowed to eat or drink. And so what was happening in the church is when they'd go to the communion table, 
just like it would be today. Some of the more wealthy people were, were bigger givers and everything, and so they would come to the table first, and they would eat and drink, and those of low status would stand back because it's what they'd been groomed to do by culture, and they would just watch, and Paul shows up, and he's ticked off, writes them a letter, says, you guys, knock it off. In the kingdom of God, there's not status. There's a status. Child of the king. There's one status. And he blasts him for it. Then he says, let me explain the head coverings to you. Go read this scripture. Go look at the original Greek. The head covering is, is not a sign of authority over the woman. The word head means source. Like the head of a river is a source and Paul's writing, he says, look, when you guys come together, I want to remove status. And how he does this is he says, I want the women to wear a head covering. Now, you've got to stop and ask this question. Why would Paul ask this? Dr. Cynthia Westfield, in her book on Paul and gender, she writes that at the time of Paul's writing, the Greek model for gender was easily combined with the rhetoric of Octavian, AKA the Caesar Augustus in 9 BC, that he strict, his strict moral laws in an effort to restore traditional values to the Roman Republic uh, in both culture and religion. And it says this, that Octavian's laws targeted promiscuity and also low population crisis among the Roman elite. And he promoted the marriage of Roman women to Roman men and he uh, discouraged women from committing adultery and he discouraged men from the same. He rewarded motherhood and established dress codes for women that signals a woman's legal status and class. So if a woman was a Roman citizen, then she would wear a certain head covering that actually displayed her status. And that status wasn't that she was under, it was actually that she was over. See, a female in that culture that was a Roman elite would have status over actually a lot of the men if they were enslaved or if they were in a lower status bracket, even though she was woman, if she was in the same status bracket, she would be considered less if she was next to a male. But in a separate status bracket, if someone was lower, she'd be actually over. So the veil was actually a sign of royalty. But a veil also did something when they would come, they would take their veil off when they would go into a house often and a very rich woman would have lots of gold braided into her hair. Their hair was a big sign. They didn't have the, the, the type of dynamic we have with clothing and shoes and different things. Uh, the hair was the biggest thing. So when Paul's writing this, I want you to catch this for a second. When Paul's writing this, he says, hey, when we come together at the table of the Lord, those of you that are wealthy, you're co-equal to someone that's extremely poor. And the reason being is that at the table, we're all sinners in need of a savior. And he says, when women come into the meeting, in this culture, if a woman didn't have her head covered, it, it would leave her subject to being abused and different things could happen to her that, that were not good. And, and so Paul's saying, when a woman comes into our meeting, the very first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get a head covering. We're gonna put it on her. Not so she could be under submission and have to, have to submit to the men in the room, but so she could be elevated. And by the way, when she has that head covering on, she can prophesy, she can teach, because without her head covered, she might look like a prostitute. If someone came in with a shaved head that was a woman, it'd be like the, the nine women I passed on the street on the way here down on 82nd. And you would go, oh my gosh, that's that kind of a woman. No, we put a head covering on because when we come together, our goal is not to push people down, it's actually to pull people up. That's why Paul says there's, there's not Greek or Jew. See, when we come together, it's not about race. Yes, there are races, but in the kingdom of God, there's only one thing, and that is that we are a child of the king. Where there's not male nor female. Yes, there's male and female. God created it that way. But when I come to the calling and purposes of God, there's some people that have to put a head covering on to, to hide their gold and wealth and, and bring their status down. And there's other people we need to put a head covering on to bring them up, but we're all equal. And why this is so important is because you're, you're living in a time and a moment 
where you're being fed by culture an ideology that says how you feel is who you are. And look, if you feel elite, you're not meant to be elite. If you feel low, you're not meant to be low. The picture of a head covering is just simply Paul's addressing men and women in, in all of this. So no, I don't think women need to wear a head covering in church today. I think prophetically, we need to be a church that gives a head covering to everyone. I believe there's a prophetic picture here of who we're going to be as a church, as a people, that no matter who walks in to the church, we're going to say, hey, you have status. Let me bring you up. Hey, you're wealthy. Come, come down here. We're, we're all here at this table. You might not smell good. You might not look, but you come stand next to me. We're going to worship. Hey, you might be rich, but I'm not going to kiss the ground you walk on. I'm going to kiss the ground my God walks on. I'm going to serve him and him alone. And I'm going to realize that status is all about who I am in Christ. And when our perspective shifts, what happens is we begin to see ourselves differently. See, Paul was trying to show them that they have status you realize you have status? You're a daughter of the king everywhere you go. You're a son of the king. You have status. When, you, when I'm driving down 82nd, I forgot about the level of prostitution going on there. I didn't, I didn't look and go, man, I'm so much better than that guy that just picked up that woman. I stood there. I'm giving my life now 
teaching you and doing all those things and traveling the world and fun stuff. And some of you international students, I've been to your churches and done that. But what I want to give my life to is call them broken people. And brokenness to a place of status. This world has no status. The world's coming into agreement with your friends at your workplace that are trying to figure out, am I male or female? And everyone's telling them, you are what you are. No, they're telling them, go agree with your brokenness. It's a lie from the pit of hell. I don't want to be someone that says, no, my king made you. You fearfully and wonderfully, you've got a destiny. You've got a purpose. There's a hope and a future. But the enemy is so got us in his grips. There's women that are feeling marginalized. There's people within the, the, the communities of color that are feeling so marginalized. Like, I could never be. I thank God that my church is filled with diversity, filled with women in leadership, filled with black, white, brown, all around, everything, filled with some of the wealthiest people in my city and some of the poorest people in my city. And I just feel like today there's some people this room, if you could bow your head for a moment, that your struggle is status. And when you have no status, you just want a double portion of someone else's. When you have no status, you, you have hurts and pains. And I just feel like there's some women that you've felt like I could never, could I go be a lead pastor? Well, if I got married, I could, but that's a lie. You don't have to be married to be a lead pastor. You have to be called and anointed by the king who happens to be your father. There's some people that race has held you back. There's some people in this that you've allowed yourself to see yourself as a lower status because of the poverty level you grew up in. I just believe God wants to just eradicate the weight that's been on you that's not meant to be there and the lie and the label. And today, regardless of the label, if you feel like, man, there's a label that's been on me and I want to see it removed, could you just stand to your feet for a moment? I'm going to pray right here, right now, it's going to come a transformation in your spirit that God's going to touch you, whatever that is. And can I tell you, if that label is hindering you three percent, it's a problem. If that label, some, sometimes we feel like, well, I'm 51 percent. Well, no, you're 49 percent hurting. This world needs you at 100 percent. It needs to see you to see yourself as one that is a carrier of the Imago Day of God. I can't do everything, but I can do everything God calls me to do. Father, I thank you that you're here in this room. I thank you for the, the moment, Lord, to just preach and teach a little bit now. So, Father, Holy Spirit, you're here right now. I sense your presence, touching hearts and touching minds breaking off some lies and removing labels that are not from you. I just feel there's a couple more people that if you want to stand, just go ahead. I'm going to give you just 30 seconds to just stand before the king and say, Father, I, I, I want this removed. I want this removed. I don't want to feel like I need to be a double portion of someone else. I really want to see my portion is needed in the body of Christ. My portion is needed in PBC. My portion is needed church. My portion is needed in government. My portion is needed in the, the, in the, the, the teaching and the public sector. My portion is needed in business. My portion is needed in family and marriage. My portion is needed who you made me, designed me, created me to be. Father, I just thank you right now. And I ask that your healing oil would just flow in this room for a moment. Come on, if you're sitting down, it's because you're a person that has a form of status and that's a good thing and I want you to stand and use your status for a moment and just gather around someone who's standing and I want you to pray right now that 
whatever's been on them. You don't have to ask them. It's between them and God. But I want you to pray whatever's been on them would be lifted off. And then I want you to prophesy. If you were already standing, just go ahead and lift your hands up. The Bible says that when we pray to lift up holy hands before the Lord, is what Paul told Timothy so people can see. I want to make sure everyone's prayed for. There's some some women up here in the front. I'd like you to, if you're, if you're free, make your way up here and pray for them. But I want you to pray, and I want you to just prophesy just a simple word from the voice of the King, a scripture that comes to your mind to speak. 